Hey everybody, welcome to episode 12 of Forensics Talks. Um, I normally do an introduction at the beginning, uh, or should say uh, some announcements and that sort of thing, uh, but I'm actually going to skip that because we have a ton of material today to get through. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Leroy Hul um, Hulsey, and uh, he received his PhD in 1976 um, in structural engineering from the University of Missouri Rolla. He's owned and run three high-tech engineering research corporations. He's taught at the University of Missouri Rolla, North Carolina State University, and the University of Alaska Fairbanks. While at UAF in Fairbanks, uh, he's been an active researcher. He served as department head and participated in numerous university committees. Uh, Dr. Halsey focuses on working with students to achieve a high quality education. His research is in the fields of bridge engineering and effects of temperature extremes on structural systems like composite walls for, uh, excuse me, composite wall panels for buildings. Um, he's been an advisor for many graduate students and of special importance for our talk today. Dr. Halsey has experience in mathematical modeling using state-of-the-art methods in finite element, finite difference, and theoretical um, solid mechanics. Um, so Dr. Halsey, I'm going to bring you in here. And first off, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate right. it. Um, we have a lot of stuff here, but uh, first things first, I want to ask you about um, civil engineering and maybe think back. Uh, you, you've been doing this for decades now. And uh, what was it about engineering that caught your interest when you first started? I actually didn't really know anything about engineering. I was a, I was a carpenter working for my father, uh, putting up housing, and I wanted to be an architect. But I was in the state of Missouri, and the only architectural school was a private institution, Washington University, and we couldn't afford it. So I, uh, my father said, you know, let's package you up and take you to this other school. And I just started discovering that there was a lot of similarities from what I was doing, except I didn't know why, why I was doing it. And so then uh, through that process of, of really getting involved into understanding why we did certain things in construction, that was the, that was the lead in and never looked back. Right. Yeah, for sure. So, um, and, and you spent a lot of time, uh, I mean, you spent a lot of time with a lot of PhD students and doing research. So research, it makes up a big part of, uh, of what you do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, what I was reading in, in the, in the beginning, in the introduction, um, was there a point where you started looking at some of the finite element methods or, or was, is this something you've been doing a long time or more recently? No, this has been a really long time. Uh, I actually developed finite element uh, programs w when I was working on my PhD as well. So I needed to have a numerical model that accurately depicted what was going on in the real world. And um, my work was on the environmental influence of, of bridge structures. And so when you talk about environmental influencers, all kinds of conditions of loading and weathering and, and so forth. and and so back in those days, uh, the engineer didn't pay attention to temperature effects on bridges. And I kept wondering why, uh, wh why, why would a bridge not do so well in the atmosphere? If, it, if you put it indoors, I think it would probably last longer. So th there had to be some influences that were really important. It turns out that they, they, it was about 30% of the design loads. And so that's, that's changed the codes. And so through that process, not only did we look at it uh, theoretically, I also helped on some research dealing with test values and correlation between tests and uh, our the theory. So that's, that's where I got involved in it. And then from there, I actually wrote some programs. I sold a few, uh, but then I decided to do something else. So. Okay. Um so we're, we're going to be talking about some of the work that you've done on the World Trade Center 7. But um, in terms of finite element methods or finite element analysis, how would you describe something like that to the layperson? How would you say, well, this is this is what I'm doing? Well, uh, I guess what uh, we could probably do is take a, a piece of paper and say, I, I, there's this beautiful picture on this paper. And I'd like to simulate that beautiful picture. And so if I was to create it in a crosswood puzzle kind of thing where each piece, if it's put together right, 
will actually look very close to what that picture looked like. That's what we do when we take a big complicated thing and break it up into little pieces and put it back together. And that's the finite element. That's a finite size that we put together. And it's important to know the configurations and, and also uh, the geometry shape because if it's really, really long with respect to uh, its width, it may not be so accurate. So mm -hmm. you have to be very careful and understand the implications of shape and size and all that kind of stuff. But it's a very, very powerful technique in that mathematically we can simulate real world conditions. Uh, it's not, a, it's not exact. It's an, it's an, uh, an approximate method, but the more elements you have and the more fine, fine refinement you have, uh, the better possibility you have of, of getting an extremely close answer to what really might happen. Interesting analogy. So it's almost like a, a, a photograph that's high resolution won't look as pixelated as one that with low resolution. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah I guess that. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, since you've been working in this area, how have how have the algorithms and how has technology impacted finite element analysis over the years? Well, um, it it all started um, through what's called was called the stiffness method, and um, and then the mathematicians and the scientists and and so forth got into this game and they said, "Hey, w wait a minute, we can take and do a better job." And now, stiffness method was an exact method for beams and for you know different shapes, but when you take and start cutting these things up and you want to really closely approximate what's going on, then there were mathematicians came in and, and improved these algorithms significantly. And so that enabled us to really uh, do a really good job of approximating what might be happening on a real complicated structure. And by the way, the World Trade Center, which is what we're gonna be talking about here today, is not a simple structure, particularly when you try to explain uh, what may have happened on a given day? Yeah, now September eleventh. Yeah, for sure. And and you, I mean, you've worked on obviously cases and and things like this uh, over your career. Um, when a structure fails, or when there's there's something in doubt about a particular structure, and especially when there's a loss of life. I mean, we've um, I remember here in, in Canada there was a, a mall that uh, the, one of the parking platforms had just collapsed. And I mean, we can see them on YouTube all the time. But when something like that happens, how would you expect an investigation to proceed? Well, I would expect that uh, under ideal forensic conditions, you would have a situation and you would have something about that structure you could look at. And if you couldn't look at it, if it was completely collapsed, then you would go to the debris and perhaps like an airplane, you start putting things back together. Or if you were not able to do much of that, you would certainly pull out the materials and you would pedographically evaluate the concrete. You would microscopically evaluate the steel. You would look at whether there was damage caused by the conditions that people uh, might think might have happened, which might be overstressed, might be um, thermal expansion characteristics. All of those things you can you can pull out and and evaluate. Guess what? That was not available here. Mm. None of that was available. Okay. Unfortunately, it had been all transferred off out of out of New York and uh, went overseas yeah. for the most part. So that was really really unfortunate. And and so therefore, what do you do next? You know, you're stuck into a pickle that, okay, we got to evaluate this thing the best we can. So we go back to the original set of plans that it was actually built by, erected by, take those, put the structure back together. And so we did it uh, using, a, using AutoCAD and find an element to where we could actually look at the building and see if it matched up with the erection drawings and, and, and what we would see in the field the best we could. Okay. I, ideally, ideally, I would have, I would have preferred to been able to speak to the design engineer, structural design engineer. I would have preferred to be able to talk to the architect. I would have preferred to talk to the owner. I'd preferred to been able to talk to 
those involved in the construction of it, the material suppliers, mm -hmm. the and all of those people would have given me a huge amount of information of which I did not have available to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, fair enough. I mean, I, I've, uh, I mean, I've been through your report and uh, let me put that up here. In fact, for those of you who are interested, um, Dr. Halsey has a very, very comprehensive report uh, at the link below here. Uh, if you, you can even just do a search for UAF WTC7 and it'll come up in Google probably right away. So, uh, and there's a whole bunch of materials on that particular page. Um, so I, I wanna get into the World Trade 7 Center. So allow me to, um, I'm gonna share my screen here and I wanna go through just a little script that I planned. I, I normally try to keep this conversational, but because of the content and the type of thing that we're dealing with, it's very difficult to sort of talk about all the components without giving some kinds of visuals here. So um, let me let me go through here very, very quickly. And if, I, if, I, if I'm incorrect anything, please, please correct me. So, World Trade Center 7 was a 47-story uh, building completed in 1987. It was a steel frame and reinforced concrete uh, concrete floor construction. Um, it was built above Consolidated, uh, Consolidated Edison of New York Electric Power Substation with its first three floors uh, connected to the substation. So uh, down here, you'll see inside of this uh, ellipse here, that's where we've got the, uh, the, the original substation. Now, it's about... Um, the World Trade Center 7 is located about 107, uh, excuse me, about 105 meters north of World Trade Center 1. So this is, uh, if you see my mouse, that's World Trade Center 7 there. And then down here we have World Trade Center 1 and then World Trade Center 2. So uh, World Trade Center 1 is actually uh, closer, the closer of the two tall buildings. Now, um, World Trade Center 7 is not a symmetrical structure. So you can see it looks sort of like a, like a trapezoid. And if we look at a, a plan sort of view here, you'll see that we have one end, which is the north end, which is wider than the south end. And so the, the top end, the north end is about 100 meters and the, uh, the, the south end is about 75. And you can see shaded is the outline of the uh, Con Edison um, substation. Now, um, in terms of the timeline of events for that day, uh, 846, uh, American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. And unfortunately, uh, well, it crashes into the 93rd and 99th floors and it kills all 92 people aboard. And then at about nine, just after 9 a.m., United Airlines uh, Flight 175 crashes into the South Tower of the World Trade Center uh, between the 77th and 85th floors, killing about 65 people aboard. At about 9.59, so just before 10 a.m., the South Tower collapses. At 10.28, the North Tower collapses. Now, the North Tower is the one uh, that uh, contributes to the damage of World Trade Center 7. So um, World Trade Center 7 is uh, substantially damaged by debris, by debris when the uh, North Tower sort of collapsed. And so uh, the story is that the debris ignited fires and that sort of thing. And so what you're looking at here is a debris field, sort of an outline, uh, the largest circles being sort of the extent to which much of the material uh, was found. And right after this, what we had, um, you can see some of the damage that was mapped out. So the red areas are really what we're looking at. So the view on my right is the south face, the face that's closest to the North Tower. And then um, the small red section here is a view on the west side. So just on the, so this corner that I had there is the southwest uh, portion. Now the damage, uh, I'll just play this very quickly and you'll get to see for yourself what is happening here. Uh, you'll see that there's a, a, a little portion up on the top, the penthouse that's referred to uh, drops. And then a few seconds later, um, you'll see that the building just collapses. So um, there's a few other little videos there. Um, the building uh, from the seventh floor to the 47th floor was supported by 24 interior columns and 58 perimeter columns. And this was a building that had uh, sprayed fire resistant material. So it's not, uh, you know, it wasn't just a completely just empty steel structure, but uh, there was some, uh, obviously some, some protection. Uh, now, as the story goes there, um, was uh, in, uh, the sprinkler system wasn't working. Um, what I have on my screen here are just two views of a model. So this is a uh, the south face, this is the north face, and you can see the penthouse up on the uh, top there. So that's kind of uh, where we're getting to. 
And um, this building, uh, you can see uh, in the video before that there was some fire or some smoke, but um, uh, not a not what I would call a substantial amount. I mean, you could see the back end of the building was pretty much intact. But later in the day, um, uh, I believe it was uh, 5 p.m. ish or so, uh, the the tower goes down. So um, that's uh, that's kind of where we're at. And I have to we have to. I'm sorry, I'm going really quickly here, but we have to focus in on some of the details of the report. And there were a number of different reports. And the basic story goes that the fires caused some expansion of these beams. And this particular beam here, this 79, if you're watching this, this is of particular importance. This is sort of the critical beam that everybody has been really focusing on. And um, the, uh, the top end of my screen is the north end. So it's this northeast corner that's important. So there's a number of beams that go across and attach to a girder, which attaches to uh, column 79. And uh, we have some design uh, drawings and that sort of things. This is a schematic that I took out of uh, Dr. Halsey's report. And you can see here that there's some structure. So this uh, column right here is uh, 79. And then we have some beams and that sort of thing. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there. And I have a question for you, Dr. Halsey. First things first, the design of this particular building, what is uh, when using a steel frame or a steel structure, what is the benefit or why do you use a steel frame versus just building with concrete or whatever? Are there, what's the benefit? Well, I think it's more about um, economics. Uh, over the years, um, the concrete has been a preferential material over steel. And, and then a few years later, the steel industry gets more competitive and then they become the preferential uh, material to build buildings by. So, and you can even see a building start up as a, a architecturally as a, as one kind of building and get changed before it gets to the construction stage simply for those reasons. So there's a, there's a number of, uh, and then, then there's, there's preferences uh, by people on what they would like to have and how they could, uh, make it work, uh, such as a concrete building can be architecturally very friendly, whereas a steel building has limitations. Uh, you know, you've got an awful lot of, um, shall we say, a frame, uh, you, you've got a lot of uh, shop work to do to get a shape that's other than straight. Uh, and so, so there's disadvantages uh, if you want to go to a uh, highly irregular curvature kind of conditions uh, to go steel. But something like this, uh, where it's all straight sections for the most part, uh, is, is probably is a, a good choice to go steel. Um, I mean, is, is there anything here that uh, raises any flags in your mind that says, hey, there's, there's something designed poorly or something? I mean, it, it's built, it, I mean, they say it's built to code. Um, any, I mean, the fact that it's an irregular shape, it's not rectangular, does that, does that cause any concern? Uh, well, it, it causes um, complexity and load distribution. It uh, tends to be, I felt like the design of this building was not the most desirable. I thought uh, there, was, there, was a lot of there was a lot of complexities in it that I didn't think it needed to be there since mm -hmm. it, um, but in terms of code, uh, I did not see anything in that in this building that flagged a code violation or flagged a situation that would would make it be questionable in that in that regard. Okay. So, so and I don't know. Uh, do do I have a minute just to share something with you? Uh, I would like to say that when I started this. Uh, you know, I announced right away that uh, fire did not cr bring this building down. And the, fir the first thing I looked at, I didn't look at what NIST did. I looked at how that building needed to behave. And it became very obvious very quickly that it was not what was uh, being said. And so I, I put that out there and then that was that was before the end of the first year. And then the other three years I was working on trying to get, trying to figure out, uh, well, trying to s simulate 
NIST assumptions and seeing what they came up with, and then uh, trying to evaluate uh, the actual collapse, which was not an easy task. So anyway, that's kind of what I wanted to just share with you quickly. Um, the connections on this schematic is not uh, the uh, actually what was used to build this structure with. I mean, so so of uh, geograph geometrically, it's it's a it's a good view. Um, anyway, are you are you still there? Yeah, I'm Hello? here. I'm just okay. yeah, I'm just listening. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, just uh, show people. Just uh, we got to get people's head around this thing. What we're yeah. talking about is the uh this the corner here this is the northeast corner and then if we get inside um what we'll do is i'm just trying to get in here you'll see that there's a number of beams here and so it's this column right here so this would be column 79 that'd be failing and the connection here is not correct this is just a model for visualization um or you know something that's demonstrative so it's not uh, fully accurate um, but that particular connection looks more like this so, Dr. Halsey, can you tell me about the seated top clip connection? Yeah, it. Uh, if you take a look at the picture on your left, you'll see two things that are significant. Uh, the the column it looks like an H, looking down on on the top, and and what they did is they came in and they put plates uh, on and welded it to that uh, to that to to the outstanding legs on each side. So and those legs actually stood out from the edge of that H. And then they connected the A2001 girder, which is what you if you'd bring your arrow down, that's it. And you'll notice that there are stiffeners, a uh, web stiffeners right next to the edge, that's it right there. Uh, that web stiffener is significant because it stiffens that web and it stiffens the flange down at the bottom. You notice that that stiffener is not all the way up. It's only at the bottom where that A2001 is actually sitting on a base plate. Yes. And if thermally, what NIST said is that uh, when this thing heated up, that the A2001 slid along the base plate and slid off of that support. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, that first of all, they forgot to include the stiffener. That wasn't part of their analysis. Secondly, that uh, that outstanding leg sitting out there, uh, it it could not go past that anyway. In other words, to your left, right there, it sticks out past that uh, flange, and so therefore, it could it it would have been it couldn't move any further. Right. So, so that so if if everything I did was wrong, it still couldn't have moved past that, and, and it wouldn't these, have fallen. And these stiffeners, they're they're welded in place, correct? Yes, they're welded yes. in place. And the yeah. top, these this little bracket up top with these are these uh, studs or bolts? I'm not sure what that is, but this looks like a welded plate, and then this is just and then the bolts bolted, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then bolted in place. Okay, yeah. so this is important because what what? Okay, just for everybody to be clear here. What we're saying is that this beam, there's some, there's some other members uh, beams uh, onto this uh, perpendicular to here. That when they heat up, it's going to push this beam. Looking at the view on the right, off here. But uh, like Dr. Halsey says, there's some, uh, there's some portions which are overhanging, which is going to stop here. Plus, you have these stiffeners. These stiffeners were not included in, in this report, and I think that's that's super important. Yeah. Um, what about the the type of modeling that was used by NIST. So for example, um, I saw that you had a very extensive model. Let me see if I just if I got it here. So this here, what I have on my screen is the model that uh, was produced by you and your team. Um, could, what can you tell me about this model in terms of its accuracy? Um, I, I would say it's uh, extremely accurate uh, because we what we did is we initially modeled it and we used what's called a coarse mesh and then we kept refining the mesh and when you don't start when you don't see any changes to your results or minimal changes to your results you you're converging in on a solution that you're looking for and and that's that's what i did okay. and so so we you know if you'll notice that green 
those are not, that's just not a solid. That's a whole bunch of little pieces put together to create that shape. And so when we did all of that, uh, we were getting really, really uh, very, very good results in what, what we were looking for. Okay. Um, in terms of, I mean, you, you had mentioned fires and the fact that NIST is saying that, you know, there, there, were, there were fires on the building. Um, and uh, you, you can sort of read in the reports the progression of fires. They actually, and it, it appears that the, the, the south side is the part that actually gets struck. But the fires progress both uh, clockwise and counterclockwise around the building over time. And it's interesting that it's the northeast corner that actually is the part that is uh, th that they're saying had failed first. So right. in terms of fires, um, it, some of the uh, there was a reference to an a ASTM standard, and that fires on on the floors. So if something's burning in a room that you know this the, the above you, they can reach close to five hundred and ninety uh, degrees Celsius, about eleven hundred F, and because they had the uh, sprayed fire resistant material though, uh, the temperatures typically don't exceed about 400, 750. What can you tell me about um, steel's response or the type of material that was used here in terms of temperature? Well, in, in this case, uh, I think I think NIST came out and said that the uh, temperature did not exceed uh, 200 degrees C. And I, I came up with a similar result uh, and so that's about 392 degrees F. And so what that at Fahrenheit. And, and so at that point, you're not getting much loss of re, of strength or change in modulus of the, of that steel. When you, when it starts going larger temperatures, then you start getting a degradation of this capability to carry load and its capability to, to, to deform properly. So, uh, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I uh, essentially there's a we have a curve in our report that shows how it degradates with temperature, and uh, and and so in this case there were there were fires spread around, but uh, the question is is another question that that I asked from the day one is what what where, where was the uh, what, where was the um, fire combustibles at? What produced it? Because most of these were um, financial operations or governmental operations, and they would have had everything in safes. I don't, I don't understand where all the fire combustibles were coming from, other than coming in from the, from the building that uh, fell down, uh, World Trade Center, the other World Trade Center buildings. So right. it's, it's an interest. So these are just office fires or whatever you have. And, yeah. you know, people might have a, a, a printer, your desk, your chairs, your whatever other materials you're working on. And sure. that would be this. That's the source of the, the, the you know, or what's burning. Um, so I guess the question is, though, in your models, did you use the fire re the retardant material in the model or did NIST use it or is it not used? I did not use it. Okay. And, I, and that's conservative. Because I wanted to see uh, if we had the fire going in there, what what conditions did we have to worry about? I did it. There was a a a, a, a um, uh, what what do we call it? Uh, on on the floor, it's a concrete floor it's connected to these steel beams and 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 um, girders, and of course NIST. Uh, uh, didn't account for the fact that there were shear connectors on it, but there actually were. Uh, so that made it stronger than they would have thought otherwise. Uh, but underneath that, it was a drop it down ceiling. And that was a cavity. And I did look at the temperature migration through that whole scenario as well, which uh, I wasn't sure if it would make a difference or not. It didn't make much of a difference, but, but I did look at that. Uh, and um, so, so the thing that uh, is kind of interesting is that, uh, you know, the concrete system, the concrete steel system uh, acting compositely uh, does significantly enhance the strength of that system under any duress that's going on. So, okay. So let's talk about the reports for a second, because I want to understand uh, what what NIST and maybe others have suggested about this particular area. 
And so when it comes to this particular area, the, they're suggesting there's fires and then this beam uh, or this girder falls off of column 79. So um, how does that relate to these other beams that are moving across here? Well, keep in mind that NIST uh, looked at uh, the exterior of the building to be fixed. In other words, couldn't move. And so if you put your, uh, I guess your pointer up to number 40 on the exterior, uh, that kind of gives you an, an idea of the east side, northeast side of this thing. Mm -hmm. And if it starts expanding, it's going to start moving with respect to that line, 40, 35, 40. And uh, in all the movement then moves towards 79 and 44. So the, the assumption that they're making this, but this boundary condition they're saying is that the outside wall is not going to, is not going to move. Even Correct. though there's nothing on the other side to hold it back. Correct. They're suggesting that it's fixed rigidly and that everything is going to move to the west in our case. Correct. That being said, uh, there are beams th through there. Uh, like at 79, but to the right of it. And in other words, going from 79 over to the line 3540, there's a beam uh, going from uh, at, at 79, column 79, uh, from left to right. Uh, you go upward, you get another one left to right, you go mm -hmm. up, another one left to right. And then at the very top near 4442, you got one going from left to right. But there's members that are crossing are coming down and fastening to it mm -hmm. to give it um, buckling resistance as a po uh, and it's it's framed into the exterior wall system okay so all of those he heated up uh, and and that one up there buckled per nist but if they put those little beams in there which they didn't uh, it's it wasn't going to buckle and so all of that stuff affected what was going to happen on girder A2001, which was framing from 79 to 44. Okay. Now, did NIST use, uh, in their assumption, did they assume that there was no fire retardant material as well? Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm pretty sure that that's the case. I would have to go back and review that uh, again. Okay. Uh, but but uh, we, di we did look at it uh, as the same way that they did. Okay. I wanted to give it the benefit of the doubt so that there would not be, you know, any questions about whether we may have, what, what, the only thing you can do in a case like this is you look at the maximum, the maximum and the minimum and, and, and see where you are within it. And uh, you, you want to make sure that you haven't uh, describe something that's not even remotely possible. Well, so, that, I guess that's my, my question was going to be, is there, is there some kind of a, what would be the reason for fixing the outer wall? I have no, I have no idea. It, it, it's not fixed. No, it's not. I it's mean, it's, flexible. It's a, yeah. Well, that makes sense to me. So, um, so, the, so the very first thing when I, the very first thing, less than a year I end, I said, wait a minute, this thing is actually not, moving to the west uh, I mean it, it's moving to the east so yeah, if you, so if you really stop and look at the thermal expansion of this floor system the the stiffest area within that floor system thermally is near the elevator shafts and so the movement if you heat up this floor if you heat up this floor, it's going to be somewhere near those elevator shafts and it's going to move in all directions with respect to that point. So so the relative movement actually at column 79 was not anywhere close to what they said it was mm -hmm. between the column and the, and, the, and the girder. Interesting. So okay. anyway. So, and so just to be clear for the people listening, what yeah. NIST is suggesting is that this outer wall is fixed. These beams here start to expand and they've left them free to expand. So they're basically free to expand. There's none of these small little, uh, smaller beams here that are connecting this one. And basically that this girder here um, passes, crosses past the column. And even though the column a design that we just discussed has some overlapping points which would block uh, the right. girder from passing. 
um, they still have made it. Now, there was a change to their report. And I, can you tell me about the, the difference? So there was like a, there's like a 5.5 inches versus a 6.25. Can you explain what happened there? Well, that bearing plate is 11 inches wide and they, they were uh, coming back and they said five and a half, 5.5 inches was their relative movement between uh, A2001 and that girder and, and that column 79, uh, which would, and then they discovered, oh my gosh, I, I don't know what their purpose was, but they then came back and said it's got to be 6.25 inches of movement, which which would have shoved it off. Okay. If there um, weren't any restrictions. Right. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> yeah. If it was free to move and you, you just basically disassembled everything or, or right, got rid of right. some certain things. Yeah. Um, in another report, so this was the... Um, uh, there was there was a, a difference, and I don't remember if it's the Nordstrom report. So there were there were four reports. There was uh, FEMA, which is the federal federal emergency right. management agency that was issued in May of two thousand two. There was NIST, which was in November two thousand eight. But there was also some little litigation going over uh, this particular building. So there was uh, something. Uh, what was the company called? Uh, Ovi Arup and Partners, and uh, Guy. Nordenson. So I guess it's the Nordenson report, which was issued in April 2010. And then there was another one, which was the Defense uh, Weidlinger Associates, and they came up with their own uh, sort of theory as to what happened. But it's interesting that in the Nordenson report, actually, they're suggesting that the opposite happens. So um, if we go back to our little model here, what we were talking about in this in this figure, um, what they're suggesting is that I believe these beams are buckling. S sagging, I think. Or sagging, right. sagging, excuse me, sagging, right. You're right. And due to due to a load coming down on them, uh, and we, we examined that. Uh, you know, the other thing, they didn't give any credit to the concrete the fact that the concrete and the steel was working together, uh, giving a huge amount of stiffness there. But the point load that they put on it was not an accurate point load. It was a dynamic load that was spread over an area, and so the the amount of uh, the amount of load actually being imposed, uh, we don't agree with what what they had in that respect. So, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and I'm I'm bothered by the fact that uh, not a lot of um, credit was given to the concrete floor system uh, in, by any of these people. Uh, in reality, that floor system was pretty significant. And I, I looked at it thermally as well as just structurally. So, And when you say that, um, and what basically what you have, if I understand it correctly, you've got some metal uh, metal plates sheeting that's it's sort of a corrugated, I guess you'd call it. And then there's yeah. concrete poured into that. And Correct. they're and they're fastened. Uh, there's like studs that hold the two together, uh, like 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 Correct. rebar almost. Okay. Yeah. The, well, there's re reinforcing bars in the concrete, but there's also what's called shear studs, which is like bolts that are welded into the flanges of those girders and beams, and that then concrete is poured in what are stay in place forms called, and they've got flutes. Those flutes are such that they they actually give them added strength in one direction different strength than another direction that makes it further more complicated yeah. you know because it it's not going to deform uh, the same way thermally uh, because of the matted concrete and by the way the uh, the thermal conductivity of the concrete is quite different than it was of the steel mm -hmm. and so you've got that issue going on thermal the thermal expansion or the thermal um, shall we say the uh, thermal properties are quite different between the two. Uh, and it's a function of the aggregate that goes in there. So okay. uh, any, anyway, we, lo well, we looked at all that. Okay. So let's, let's say for just hypothetically, let's say that uh, for whatever reason, you know, uh, uh, the, the connection at, at 79 column 79, it's, it's uh, free to move. And we get this uh, girder that, that falls, it, it falls off of its, its support. So at that point, um, so in my mind, when I think of the steel structure, I, I see this lattice, you know, all this, this these interconnected uh, beams. And so, you know, if you remove one connection, I can't imagine everything just disappearing, uh, like everything just progressively collapsing. So is it possible for that, uh, that girder to fall off and then 
successively cause, you know, start this ripple effect where one, you know, it's a progressive effect where the next column fails, the next column fails, the next beam fails, and so forth? Well, you can certainly uh, simulate that, but the problem is <clears throat> this building is not symmetrical. So if you start playing that little game and it's going to tilt, uh, it's not going to be, and we did se examine all that. Uh, it's not going to come down as the video shows you. So, so that whole scenario is not something that, that could have happened. It just, I, I mean, there's so, so many reasons why it couldn't have happened. So, you know, yeah. that's, just, that's just another. So we looked at uh, interior columns coming out. We looked at exterior columns coming out, and, you know, in, in various states. Almost every, uh, a tilt. So, uh, so what we did is we uh, ultimately, finally, uh, uh, took uh, and we started saying, "Like, okay, what what could have happened to create what we see?" And it became very clear that we had to take out all the interior columns and the exterior columns of, of uh, slightly after that point in time. And that would have enabled it to come straight down. That's interesting. Now, the the Weidlinger Associates report actually s says that you know this this beam will come down, but there was also other floors that were coming down. But the temperatures that they were using were you know twice what uh, they're they're saying something you know up up in the range of eight hundred degrees Celsius on these on these other floors. But I guess the question is, what's the source of fuel at that point? Uh, to to cause well, and, that. And where were, yeah, and where were most of the fires anyway? They were on the twelfth, certainly below floor thirteen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, correct. Um, so so also to clarify, when you talk about um, th this progress or the modeling that you did in order to sort of simulate what we see in the video, are you you're actually you're you're literally cutting the connections at all the beams or, or is or at, is that what you're doing or how, how you're modeling that well <clears throat> over over eight stories we cut cut the, the the columns directly off so that they couldn't provide lateral support or they couldn't provide axial support and uh, that enabled them to to move down a, as a unit uh, enough to be able to move the whole thing down I think if it, if I recall correctly, I think it was eight, at least eight stories that we had to have to make that happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, then the exterior slightly after that, but, but in reality, uh, that column 79 up there, uh, actually had to come down, uh, at the top between floor 45 and 47 to supporting that, um, uh, what what uh, the, pen, the the penthouse, penthouse up there yeah, the penthouse. at the top? Yeah, but actually, there's uh, actually on your on your website actually there's a uh, a reference to a YouTube video. So it's this one here. I'm just going to shut the sound off. But if uh, what Dr. Halsey is referring to is, you can see this penthouse. It just goes down, and so something internally has to cause it to fail. But yet we don't see anything on the exterior that that goes down until everything just sort of falls. And that's sort of an interesting point um, too. And I'll just let me just play that again is that if, how can everything on the inside collapse and still have the exterior intact until it, it and it just drops straight down? Well, that's a, that, that was about a year's study right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So many questions about, you know, can you even get, get anything to, to happen like that? Right. You know, so. Well, I mean, the implications of what you're talking about, obviously, um, and again, you know, World Trade Center is obviously, everything is just controversial. So I wanted to keep this on the science and I want to keep this on your report. Um, but um, in, if if you take the time to read it, and I would suggest for people to, to really sit down and start going through it, and, and it's not an easy read, I'll, I'll give you that. You have to sit down and really look at it. But um, once it does click, um, you'll start to see where all the problems rest and lie with the NIST report and some of the other reports. And so, um, uh, yeah, so I, I understand what you've done. And I understand also, uh, we talked about this uh, the other day, which is 
Um, you know, you're not trying to suggest what happened. Uh, you know, you don't have an explanation exactly for everything that happened on that thing, but you can say what didn't happen, right? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that, I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. Um, in NIST's own, because NIST did a, um, in their own modeling, um, they had their own sort of simulation that they did. And did they stop it at a certain point? Because I, I don't actually see it ever like coming down all the way. It, it probably did. I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, I, the, the model um, just seems like it does not really describe what went on there. No. <clears throat> and they, I mean, they had a good, they had a great piece of software. The, and so you know that was i don't know what the issue was okay so, well let me let me ask you about that let's talk yeah. about the software so you actually you you did this twice in fact so you had um and how uh, you may want to just uh give a plug to your your students the research uh, uh actually you had a postdoc too i believe no no i didn't oh okay, uh, okay but but i had two two phd students okay each one of them using a different computer program one was using abacus the other using sap uh, and we would do the uh, simulation and then we would have both of them doing it and seeing if they got good correlation uh, we we did that uh, and then i would review it and so we would have a discussion we would have a critique it was a quality control methodology that i was using to try to make sure that when we looked at anything that we had scientifically evaluated it uh, correctly and so before we would move on to, to another step in the process I see. and in the end uh, uh, when you were for example when looking at the the thermal expansion and the movement of the, the girder at column 79 what kind of numbers did you have or what kind of differences did you show up between the two, uh, yeah. hardly any difference. I mean, you know, within within a uh, shall we say eighths of an inch or something like that, it was just very little differences. Okay. And, and between the two models, two, but but and the two programs, I mean, both programs um, are very very good at what they do. Um, SAP two thousand was generated by Edward Wilson at uh, initially at uh, B University of California Berkeley. And uh, the abacus was put together by a, a private group. And it's just both programs are excellent what they do. Um, uh, the learning curve on abacus is much higher, however. Uh, so I felt like scientifically abacus would do really, really a great job. Uh, and I'd used it before. And uh, it, it really kind of gives you the ability that if it isn't able to do everything, you can write an algorithm to add it to him and, and give it the capability to do it. Okay. And so, I mean, it's really quite powerful. SAP, on the other hand, is it, uh, is it really, really quite um, powerful, but it also enables you to get things done quicker. You know, so there's a <clears throat> there's a benefit to that process. So, which which one did you see mentioned that NIST had a good program? So, which one did they have? I, um, shoot, I think it was L A N or something like that. I can't remember the name of it okay. uh, right this minute, but they they it was a good. It's it's an excellent program. <coughs> okay. Excuse me for a second. Um, well, I guess I well, I guess the, the the problem I'm having here is trying to figure out why an agency um, like NIST who have very good people. Uh, Absolutely. I've, I've, I've met people there. They're, they're very good. Uh, there are some very strong minds. There are some very good people. Um, how they could let something like this pass from a quality control standpoint. I mean, there should have been a lot of peer review done, uh, you know, just following up a, a simple process like you would when you publish a regular paper. Right. And somebody would have had to have seen this and had to approve uh, this thing for, for publication. Um, so I, I'm trying to imagine in my mind why something like this would pass because um, it was interesting. Uh, I watched a video the other day of somebody asking you straight out and I'll ask you here, but if a student had handed in a paper doing this, this exercise to you, uh, you know, would you, you give them a pass or a failing grade? Well, you know, that question was actually asked of me for, and it would have to be a PhD student uh, to, to ask that question. And I, and, and I would have flunked him. Yeah. 
you know, you know, it's you got to be you got to be correct when you do something. I don't know why uh, they had it. Um, they missed all these steps, but uh, you know, they they're an excellent group. They do outstanding work. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't know what mm -hmm. what the answer to that is. Okay, so let me ask you, what's what's next for you at this point? I mean, you've done the study. You sort of, you know, it it is what it is. Uh, you know. It, it, it makes a very strong point for sure. Um, but what, what are your plans at this point? Well, I, I'm going to write a couple papers, uh, peer reviewed journal articles on it. Um, and that, you know, I just retired. So I'm in the process of take re examining what I'm going to do. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think, I think that's definitely where I'm heading right now. So. Okay. Interesting. And, um, how, how has your study been received by architects, engineers, and sort of the scientific community in general? I, I, I don't know the answer to that completely. I do know that there's a, uh, a I, I've given the presentation to several people, several engineering groups, and they've all been incredibly, uh, received, they've, they've really received it well. Uh, it's, you know, you might go, sometimes people go into these things thinking one thing and, they, and, and you see them transformed automatically. When, when you start providing the compelling evidence of what, what we found, then they, I haven't seen any that left saying, wow, yeah. you know, that, that this, is, this is truly something to, to think about. Yeah. So there's, there's a, well, obviously there's a mountain of information on YouTube and I didn't want, I didn't want to get into the controversy and such, but even for myself, I didn't want to, I mean, I, I know that, you know, there's bias and that sort of thing. So what I did was I was watching debunking videos. Good. So I was watching videos that actually pose the other side and there were some good points until I read your report. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. was some, there was some good points, right? you know, why something happens or why something di didn't happen. Um, I mean, and there are other things that we aren't discussing. So for example, some of the, uh, I believe it's in your report as well, but some of the uh, metal which was found, um, and I forgot the exact term of what it was called, I have it here, but it had something to do with eutectic, uh, it had, had to do, something to do with an elevated temperature. Right. Um, yeah, so, um, which gives evidence or is, is a type of evidence, but basically says that, you know, it's just a, a standard office fire you know, is not going to uh, provide sufficient heat or temperature That's correct. Um, to the metal. Right. So there, there has to be something else there. And as another point too, that because of the, the substation that was there, um, I think everybody agrees that it, there's no diesel fuel or some other fuel uh, that was uh, uh, pretty much left intact, if I'm not mistaken. I, I shouldn't say entire. Of course, the building collapsed. But what I mean yeah. is that it, it wasn't a source right. of of fire. Yeah. Okay. So, so in the past and and today, even um, I don't want to get into the controversies because uh, my my report, uh, the way I see it, is it was based on pure science. I tried to not allow anything that might have been a possibility of somebody thinking one thing and or feeling a, a, a different idea, uh, I would listen and read the science aspects, but not not uh, what people were might be saying on the street, mm -hmm. you know. So um, let the, let the package stand for itself scientifically. Well, I think that's uh, I, I feel the exact same way. So I, I'm not I was not going to ask you anything uh, like that either. And I think you know what this is probably a good a good point to end the conversation on on a note like that. We'll just leave it with the science and let it yeah. speak for itself. Well, okay. look, hey, listen, I can't tell you how grateful I am. Some great information. I again, I want to commend yourself and your team. The report is really well done. It's very well um, organized. Um, it's uh, well written. Uh, it reads well, and uh, I. <laughs> I don't always enjoy reading papers. I have to tell you that it's not always a fun thing to do, but I actually was interested in reading this and, and it sort of caught my interest. So um, do me a favor, uh, just hang back for a second. I'm just gonna make some closing comments and then I'll come back. Great, thank you, you very much.
All right, everyone. Well, that does it for episode 12. Um, next week, I'm going to be interviewing uh, David Cam. And if you don't know about the David Cam story, he was wrongfully imprisoned for 13 years uh, for a uh, triple murder, something that he didn't do. And it was the murder of his wife and two children. Uh, there was a big controversy about uh, the David Cam case in the, um, the bloodstain world and um, uh, quite a lot of information. And the nice part is uh, we're going to hear it right from David Cam himself and uh, how things were perceived from his end. So on that note, everybody, hey, thanks a lot. Uh, great talk today. And hopefully I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.